think one issue that applies in both contexts is what we call the digital divide which I know you deal with here. It's a global problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. The digital divide is the inequality of access between people who live in certain parts of the country or go to certain schools and can afford a very high level of access to technology, both in schools and in their homes and in other places, and other people who have very limited access to technology or, in some cases, none at all. And clearly that's something that Argentina and I think almost all countries around the world are dealing with, um, the people who have access to technology have even more opportunities to learn, to get jobs, to network and to make connections that benefit them more and more and more that people who don't have access to those same technology networks never even get to participate. Another one, which is partly related to the example, is the uses that, people, that young people make of the technologies for non-educational or even anti-educational purposes, whether it's surfing the web for pornography or using their cell phones in this way to record embarrassing or, uh, or insulting information. And so one of the ways in which people often deal with them in schools is through acts of prohibition. I understand where that prohibitionist response comes from, because these are, as we talked about, real dangers and real distractions. Um, they can even become erosive to the climate of the school or of the classroom, erosive to the authority of the teacher. On the other hand, the technologies are increasingly part of our lives. They're part of young people's lives. And I don't think we can solve this problem simply through a, a prohibitionist approach. I don't think we can solve them just by saying, we're going to keep these things out of schools and pretend that they don't exist because they're, they're too valuable as potential educational resources to be left outside the school or left outside the classroom. And I think the challenge for educators is more one of how do we use these things for educationally productive purposes than how do we keep them out of the school entirely. One of the myths of technology is the myth of technological progress, that new technologies solve our problems and make our lives better. Sometimes that's true. But I think every technology, even technologies that make our lives better, also create new problems, new difficulties that we usually don't anticipate when we first invent the technology or first adopt the technology. And Typically, we only really find out about the dangers or the risks of the technology after the fact, after we've already become partly dependent on it, uh, and after the fact that it's probably too late to make the technology go away. And so this idea of risks and promises, uh, potentials and dangers, possibilities and limitations, to me are the two sides of every technology. I give my students an assignment in school and that is go out into your neighborhoods and interview some of the elderly people uh, about their childhood and what it was like 60 years ago or 70 years ago in this country or in this neighborhood uh, and do oral histories with those elderly people and then we'll bring those videos back into the classroom, we'll download them on the computer and we'll do an oral history project for our, our social studies class about the history of our neighborhood or our country or whatever, using these uh, older people as informants. Well, that capability of the cell phone to do video recording is here a very valuable educational resource. But it's that same capability that produced the problem and the situation that you just described with the teacher and the hair on fire, the recording of the teacher with the hair on fire. And we can't say, well, here's this resource, but you can only use it for these purposes and you can't use it for the others. Once it's there, it's going to be used for a lot of different purposes. I often use the example of the automobile that, you know, roughly 100 years ago, if you had said to people, hey, there's this great new invention. You can use it to get around the town, to travel across the country. It will create new jobs and new cities. It will create much more mobility. Families will be able to see each other. But you have to build highways, which will cover the ground in concrete. You have to build parking lots. 
that the automobiles create pollution. You need to buy gasoline, which means you need to buy oil, which means you're dependent on Middle Eastern economies, and maybe that promotes terrorism. You know, so suddenly now there's all these bad things that we realize that automobiles also bring with them, both directly and indirectly. And if you had said to people a hundred years ago, you have the choice, would you, do you want it or not? We don't realize how dependent we become on technologies until they've already become so much part of our lives that it becomes almost impossible to imagine going backward between the things that we want that are educationally valuable in these technologies and the things that we don't want that are, as I said before, even anti-educational or they interfere with education. And that dilemma is where we're living as, as educators today. And as I said, I think we'll still be living with it in 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. The technologies will change, but the dilemma, I think, is an existential dilemma. Mm -hmm.